Our next speaker this afternoon is Dr. Tom Stein. Tom Stein is the director of Animal Health and Ventures for Merck Animal Health. He is the creator of the PigChamp software and co-founder of Meta Farms. National Hog Farmer Magazine named him one of the top 50 men and women who truly made a difference in the U.S. pork industry over the last 100 years. In 2011, the American Association of Swine Veterinarians presented Dr. Stein with the Howard Duane Howard Dune Award for Outstanding Contributions to Swine Production and Health. In 2019, Dr. Stein received the George Foxcroft Award from the Banff Port, Con Port Con Conference for rigorous and high-profile research, which contributes to improvements in pork production efficiency. Let's welcome our speaker. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, happy to see a lot of old friends in this room, and I appreciate the invite. First time I've spoken at the Iowa uh, Swine Day. Um, and so first I have to explain that uh, I was with uh, Maximus for five years after I left Meta Farms, and uh, Maximus was acquired by Ingersoll Rand, and so uh, the owners left after about a year, and I decided I was going to leave the same week I decided that I was going to uh, leave Maximus, um, this position came up with uh, Merck Animal Health. And it's in the Animal Health Ventures group. And uh, I thought this is um, a great opportunity because, um, so my job is I go around the world looking for technologies, practical technologies for pork producers and companies that are doing that, startups, um, companies that we might collaborate with. So the Animal Health Ventures Group is the internal venture capital group for Merck Animal Health. So there's that piece of it. And then the other role I have is um, putting those technologies together with the R&D team to put something together that we can deliver for pork producers that you'll find valuable and um, and implementable in your system. So it's a, it's a fantastic role, and I I'm, I'm really appreciate the opportunity to um, join Merck Animal Health, great company, and also to sort of cap the career I've had with this, um, with this opportunity. So I've learned a lot, really. I joined, the, I joined Merck um, Animal Health Ventures last October, and, um, and so um, since then it's been, uh, you know, 200 miles an hour kind of ramping up on what's going on all around the world. And not only that, the group I'm in, which includes John Kolb, many of you know John um, from Iowa here, uh, but it also includes um, all the other species, including dogs and cats. So these are people within the group that I'm in, small group, that they're looking at what's going on with dogs and cats technology-wise, what's going on with in poultry around the world, in aquaculture around the world, beef cattle, dairy cattle, uh, cow-calf feedlot, and pigs. Um, of course, chickens uh, and turkeys and, um, and the rest. So it's a great group. And so we have this cross-fertilization of who's doing what, what do you see, who's doing, what, what technologies are emerging. And so um, that is uh, kind of coloring the presentation I'm giving today. So uh, I just want to uh, say a couple things about um, maybe, you know, Dan's presence. I love listening to Dan. He's, we speak the same language, not French, money. And, uh, and so I, I always enjoy uh, listening to you. The, that question about the, the, what percentage of trials are successful, I, you know, I, um, Ashley DeDecker from Smithfield, who's their head of uh, production R&D, says they do maybe 50 or 60 trials a year, and six to seven are successes. So just to kind of give you a sense of how you have to decide you're going to spend money, and you're going to, the failure is as, as important as the success, right? Um, and by the way, so this is an art installation from, I saw it at the Renwick Gallery in Washington, D.C. Uh, so that's like uh, 12 feet tall, and 15 or 16 feet wide. And I just thought it captured everything really that, um, that I believe about uh, the, the changes and the way technology changes the swine industry. I started, I worked on a, 
about an 800 sow operation while I was um, going to vet school at the University of Illinois. I, for, for three years, I started at the lowest of the low. I was you know, power washing and scraping manure and hand carrying feed to uh, you know, archway feeders and that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and so, you know, Cargill modified open fronts were the, were the uh, state of the art back then, right? So um, we've, you know, now it's a quad, you know, wean to, quad wean to finish barn with tunnel ventilation, et cetera, et cetera. So you know what the changes have been. So keep in mind that, uh, and I, I'm, for the, I have said that what we're doing, my generation, what we're doing is passing the baton to the younger generation. I mean, with Pig Champ and Meta Farms, which I was pretty involved in, uh, you know, that we've created benchmarking, but benchmarking, a lot of the answers are not in benchmarking databases, right? We're passing the baton now to the younger generation to find insights and action uh, in terms of um, trapped value. And I'll get back to that idea of trapped value in production systems. Um, the, uh, so I want to do two things in this presentation, and I've got, you know, uh, of course, I've got like 110 slides, not quite that many, but I've got plenty of, uh, plenty of slides, so I'll go through pretty quickly. But I want to do two things. One is uh, I did an analysis of publicly available information, uh, interviews that Laura Greiner did with a couple people from these different production companies, and I did a compare and contrast of the different approaches that these four production companies, publicly available information, things that they've published or made um, statements and interviews and all the rest, and they, they take different approaches to production. But I, um, I can't go into all the detail. I'm going to cherry pick a couple key pieces of that, and then I'm going to dive into particular technologies and give you an idea of what's going on out there, what's happening. Um, the, uh, but I, when I was at, with Maximus, I started writing um, a newsletter. It was a weekly, not really weekly, ended up being every couple of weeks that um, I called Brain in the Barn. And so it was me like posting an article or an analysis or a newsletter on um, essentially like Substack, right? So an email newsletter called Brain in the Barn. And I did this analysis. It's available. You can, all you have to do is Google Brain in the Barn, look for issue number 60, and you'll get my entire analysis of the different approaches that these companies are taking to, um, to R&D, right? And then I, one of the things I'm going to do is go jump into some of these new technologies, but that list could be double the length, at least, uh, of what I've got up here. So I, I have to say I want to talk about the stuff I know, that, I mean, that I've had some experience with and that I'm familiar with, and leave out a bunch of stuff that, um, that I probably should talk about if I had more time, right? So, um, one of the um, one of the fellows that I've borrowed pretty heavily from is David Rosero. He's been the most open at um, uh, publishing or presenting the results that they've gotten on the R and D side at, at uh, Hanor, um, and uh, he, you're going to hear more of his results a little bit later because he graciously shared his um, slides with me. He gave two talks this year, one at AASV um, and another one at Midwest Animal Science meetings that were fantastic uh, presentations. But I just wanted to start by saying, you know, they've, he's talked about what it is that they're looking at. And I don't know, hopefully you can read some of this. But OK, so these are, these are some of the big things that they're looking at from a technology standpoint and, and trying them out, right? So, and, you know, environmental sensors, and you've seen how barn tools has emerged as a great monitoring tool, um, distinct is out there. Then you've got all the control companies like Maximus or Fancom or AP with Edge and uh, et cetera, right? So, um, so I, the big thing that's happening with sensors right now is people putting in not just one temp sensor, whatever, but maybe 10 or 15 or 20 in, um, in barns, especially poultry, not so much pigs, but especially poultry. Um, feed bin sensors, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, not in depth, but just I'd, uh, hopefully, I mean, I assume that many of you were at the expo. Uh, how many feed bin monitoring technologies did you, did you see there? This is, you know, exploding, sort of big exploding area. Um, and they're trying, they put, uh, 
I know that at um, Hanor, they were, that, in fact, all the, the first feed bin sensors that people have started using, in the poultry industry, it's 100% load cells, right? So bin track or chore time or, um, you know, uh, AP or Maximus. I mean, there's a lot of ways to get load cells, bin, bin track being sort of the first commercially available company that focused primarily on load cells. But now there's a million more, and I know that they're experimenting at Hanor with a couple different um, feed bin monitoring tools. Uh, smart cameras, I'm going to talk a lot about that in this presentation. Telemedicine, I think that's pretty interesting because he's the only one out of all of those production companies I mentioned that really is talking about telemedicine, and I'm, uh, I'm going to go into that a little bit more. And then robotics, uh, the ones you've seen, I think, probably if you were at the expo, you saw the, the robotic power washers. Robotic power washers for farrowing rooms uh, definitely have um, really come into play right now. I mean, Pipestone, I think, um, has maybe 80 of them at this point within their sow farms. Um, so that's, that's just one, oh, and let me just go back to that for a second. That's one look at what one company is saying, these are the kinds of things that we're studying. And they've got, in terms of evaluation, so accuracy, reliability, implementation, it goes back to what Dan was saying, other, other people said the same thing, is that, uh, you know, like if you're gonna put a camera in, it's gotta be up and running. 98% of the time, right? So that's a big part of what they've been doing at Hanover is to look at that sort of um, reliability piece of the puzzle. And, uh, you know, no surprise that in their uh, evaluation that it's either revenue, cost, or um, profit, right? So, you know, I mean, that's the bottom line. Although, I say this all the time to people, Tell me what the ROI of this is, right? So that is, that is not the way a lot of technology is chosen. A lot of technology is chosen because it makes life easier, it, or we can get a lot more accomplished by using the technology. Not on the feed side, what Dan was saying, you know, I mean, that's really well known. Um, animal nutritionists, those kind of trials are, are very well known how to do that kind of stuff. The, the technology side is a completely different picture. Um, so at Pipestone, so Pipestone pub publishes uh, quarterly what they call the, the Pipestone Journal. And so this is from winter 2021, where they went through and they, there was 40 some pages. So this, these are the things we're studying that we did study. Here's how we calculated the return on investment of these various things that were looked at. You can Google Pipestone Journal winter 2021, you'll get the whole thing, PDF format if you want to look at it in, um, in detail. But I just wanted to, I pulled out a couple things that they put in that, in that study, or I mean in that journal. Um, what did they look at and what did, they, what did they do? So these are the things that they've looked at, but this was sort of pre-COVID and maybe a little bit during COVID, but um, the infrared heat lamps. So yep, uh, they're going to implement as old bulbs, bulbs burn out, farrowing heat mats, they tried them, they're gonna put them in. Robotic power washer number one, nope, didn't work. Power washer number two, yep, implement that. I think that's the Danish one, is the one that they're implementing there. Um, wean pig conveyor, to eliminate pig pickup for vaccination. I, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, and you can see, nope, didn't work. And, and that's what, what um, Gustavo Pizarro at Pipestone will say, is that the negative results are as important as the positive results, because then we know that we don't have to even think about that going forward, right? Unless there's some new versions of technology that come out there. They moved to Porcitech mobile data enter. They use Porcitech for their sow management system. They, use, they moved to that mobile uh, app for on-farm data entry. And they did a, an ROI calculation on that, which is, which is detailed in that journal, um, in, the, in their actual article. Um, the ones that they're working on now is what they said in their, um, in their write-up. The Pig County camera, um, and I'm sure that's the Romaine camera that many of you probably saw at the expo. Um, and a second wean pig conveyor uh, that uh, they uh, think might be doing the trick. Um, and, uh, well, I'll come back to the wean pig conveyors in a minute. Processing cart efficiency, body condition cameras, 
and a sort of a Roomba feed sweeper for the alleyways. So th these are the things that they've been trying, and among, among other things, right? So uh, just to kind of give your, just to, to really whet your appetite about what these larger companies are trying. They're spending, um, like Ashley De Decker at, Pipes, or at Smithfield said, um, she's shifted her focus away from sort of nutrition trials and uh, vaccine trials to technology R&D trials and proof of concepts. And it's not that they stopped doing the other ones, but her focus has moved more towards the technology side. And, um, and it's, you know, it takes, it's not like running a trial on a, on a feed additive. It's just a completely different, it's a completely different ball game when you're trying to do these technology um, trials, proof of concepts, or even implementation. So uh, going back to David Rosero, he gave these two presentations. I asked him, uh, I said, you know, um, David, these presentations were great, and I, they want, I want to use a couple slides, so can I reference your slides? And he said, here, well, just take my presentation and use the slides that you want, um, because there's, um, there's a key point to this, right? So they've been using, for the last three years, they've been using a smart camera for getting weight estimations from a company called Asymmetrics, which is based in, um, out, coming, comes out of South America, out of Columbia, South America. And they've really been doing, you know, it's almost like collaborative product development with Asymmetrics. Um, and so much of the work that he is showing in terms of the values that they've found is coming from the work that they've done. Now there's like five other um, smart camera systems for weight estimation in pigs that have emerged in the last two years, and I'll guarantee you that there will be five more in the next two years because people have figured out, technically, figured out how to, how to do that and how to do it well. Um, now, uh, I, I, I think that in most cases, what I know from the other weight estimation companies, their, their outcomes fall into about the same bucket, which is um, their accuracies, and we're talking about like, if you go out to the market weight, the accuracy gets better the heavier the pigs go. So at market, let me say maybe from about 200 pounds on, the accuracy is plus or minus about three pounds, all right? So, um, around 97% accuracy, 98% uptime, and uh, their take on this after doing three years worth of work is to implement really throughout their system cameras. Uh, but I thought this was really cool what he had, what they've done there, which is to sort of focus on system growth monitoring. So creating um, a report that essentially each row of this report is a um, you know, is a group of pigs, right? So it's um, a wean to finish group or a, or a, a finishing group. Um, I, I can't remember which is which now in terms of what they're using. I mean, this report shows finishing. But um, so they're, they're combining real-time growth in terms of weights. Uh, that's this first section with uh, against their targets and then rolling in the environmental information. So high, low temps, humidity, and CO2, and, um, and integrating that with mortality information, and then that last chunk, besides, the mortality is the last column, but that, that one, the chunk before that is their um, load cell information, so they're getting real-time um, feed consumption, feed intake, and feed conversions. So, and they, you know, essentially then, it's just like active group monitor and MetaFarm system, uh, being able to look through and see what's going on across all of these um, groups that are on feed and how they're performing against their targets, right? Uh, and this is one of the things that they discovered. So if the, each bar there is a separate sort of growth check time, right? So you can see they're checking the growth relative daily, uh, daily gain at 110 pounds, 132, 154, 176, 198, 220, 243. That's, this is all off the camera. 
right? And so they're, they're looking at the relative average daily gain at these points in time against what they, their genetic reference, what their target is, right? And so you can see what they found, that pattern, right? That the growth, the, the growth at, as the pigs got heavier was a lot less than what they expected it should be, right? And, and so that led them to figure out, see, you know, what's, what's going on. And you can see it was all coming out of the phase three, um, the phase three weight growth period and phase three diets. So they, um, he said we made nutritional adjustments. He didn't say what adjustments, what those actual adjustments were. But they did um, make the adjustments and they did see a response and that um, for them, that was $1.82 per pig profit, but even more, which is great, okay? That's really, I mean, if you're looking at what's the value of putting in cameras, uh, what, um, th there you go. But more importantly, it was across, they saw this on 40% of their sites, right? So um, huge, huge value. That was, that's uh, over uh, $2 million on, on their system a year. Here's another example. So when you put these cameras in, you get this uh, real-time growth curve. So that's, you're getting updated growth curves, smooth growth curves off of the weight estimations, um, you know, hourly, daily, right? So it's a, it's a real-time growth curve. And he gave, showed this example of what happened when they saw that this growth curve turned on this, um, this group of pigs and that they intervened. He said they used medication to intervene, didn't say what medication it was. I'm, I don't know, maybe it was a Merck product. I don't, who knows, but they intervened. And the thing that I think is really amazing here is that those pigs turned around and gained about the amount of weight that you would expect that uh, if, they, um, you know, if they hadn't had a problem and had their growth curve turned down a bit, that, and that was, you know, for that group, that's four dollars and eighty cents marginal profit. So basically, I think what he did was say, you know, if that growth curve had continued at that plateau versus what actually happened after it intervened, that was four dollars and eighty-two cents pig on that on that group of pigs. Um, another example, and every one of the technologies that's being tested. Uh, Things like sound talks that uh, that BI has, the, their, the um, uh, watching behavior of pigs as they uh, in finishing pigs, the, the amount of time they spend at the feeder, do they go to the feeder, how many times do they go to the feeder or the water? Some of the research that's been done shows exactly the same thing: earlier detection than humans walking through a barn, right? So. This, in this case, their earlier detection, you can see it was September 20th is when the camera alerted them that there was a problem. And um, the first observed, that's somebody walking through the barn, first observed s September 26th. So you, you know, six day earlier, um, earlier detection, and that's true. Every study that's been done so far has shown the same thing. The data is a better detector earlier than, than people walking through the barn. And, and people walking through the barn, looking at the pigs, is sort of considered to be the gold standard, but um, it's not. Uh, it, 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 and it won't be in the future. Uh, it's gonna be the data that becomes the gold standard with sort of you know, added uh, complementary um, animal husbandry with the people walking through the barn. Finally, uh, another example, the marketing, where they took the standard protocol at Hanor and uh, that, you know, in terms of observing, picking the pigs out of the pen, loading them up on a truck, versus following what the camera was telling them. And what they found is that, um, you know, it, just in this case where they had some um, discounts, they didn't have any discounts with the camp when they had, the, with the, camp, the room in, that had the camera. And they did have discounted pigs in the rooms that it was people just walking in and picking out those pigs, all right? And, but even more importantly, what they saw was if they compared just their standard way of going to get the pigs and loading them up on the truck versus what the camera was showing, uh, they narrowed that, that uh, weight distribution. 
you know, that, that live weight or carcass weight distribution. And they dropped the coefficient of variation from 12% to 9.7%. And then sort of mathematically, you get a little bit better average daily gain and a bit, little bit better a feed conversion on a closeout, right? Because you've narrowed up that distribution. Uh, and I did some work on this back in 2015. This was something I published at American Association of Swine Veterinarians, where I just showed what the, now this was on uh, 83,000 loads going to multiple packers, about 12 million pigs. And uh, what this, uh, what I did was I wanted to say, I wanted some way of, of quantifying the, what the coefficient of variation was worth. And if you reduced it, what that brought back to you. And, that was, um, you can see going from 12% to 9% was uh, about $4, $4.25 a pig. And then the real improvements, um, I mean, not that $4 a pig isn't a real improvement, but then some really substantial improvements uh, if you narrowed that, that standard deviation even more, or coefficient of variation. So, uh, there's, so basically what um, I'm trying to say here is uh, with these technologies, we're in uh, what I'm going to call the value discovery phase of things, right? So there's a lot of technologies that are out there that are commercially available today or that are coming. And it's going to be, well, it took, it took Hanor um, three plus years to come up. This is the, these are the first sort of value presentations that, that they've made after that work. So, I mean, I think we've got, we're, we probably have three to five years of value discovery of these technologies as they, um, as they sort of get integrated into production, into production systems. Um, now let me just uh, dive into a couple other, a couple things that are going on. Well, first of all, how, I hope many of you have seen this presentation um, that Andy Yakubowski from Pillen has, uh, gave about how they're using cameras, especially in their nurseries to um, just look at the entire room. They've got hotel room style nurseries and they can put a camera in the, at one uh, corner or over the door and they can get a view of the entire room, right? And um, they, uh, they put in these um, simple off-the-shelf cameras that are power over ethernet with a um, network video recorder that, that you can log into and you can from remote and you can see you know, live pictures. Now you can do that with simple webcam too, but this is a con continuous recording and it stores it, right? So you don't have to actually, you can come, you know, come and take a look at it tomorrow or yesterday. Um, I mean, you can look at yesterday, you can do it you know, right away in the morning today. Um, and they, the whole reason they did this is they built, you know, they spent, they spent you know, multi millions of dollars to build new nurseries that were then um, that underperformed the old nurseries, right? So it was like, okay, let's figure out what's going on here. Let's put some cameras in. And a, a, couple, of, you know, a couple of things that were really interesting. So this is a webcam, simple webcam mounted in a corner looking at this room of pigs. And so that's a partial fill. And you can see pigs pretty uncomfortable there, right? So they had higher mortality, lower daily gains, the, in the new nurseries than they did in the old nurseries. Also, they saw, I don't know if you can see that, um, vaccinations added stress. So they saw the, a similar picture of how the pigs looked after they were vaccinated. You know, I don't know if it was on arrival or a couple days later. They made the decision to move all the vaccinations back to the sow farm because the pigs looked so bad on camera after the vac first vaccine uh, first vaccination in the in the nursery, and here's uh, what they saw when they looked at the the uh, gruel, you know, doing a, you know a wet gruel feed. Again, pigs got wet, piled, huddling. Um, look, see the on the pigs on the right hand side. I mean, everybody in this room has seen all of this over and over again as you walk through as you walk through barns. I mean, this is, there's nothing new here. The only new thing is this is being looked at 24-7 via video, which is stored, and then it can be reviewed. So 
one more thing that was interesting to them, they were, they were, they were having this, these issues again with the pigs being uncomfortable, getting sick, where um, they noticed, in looking at their environmental control data, that there, was the, there were these spikes in, in uh, humidity. And so what that was is, is they were associated with um, people doing chores. So you know how the pigs get when people are in there doing chores, they're running around, humidity goes up. Well, the, the, the workers at that, in, the, in those nurseries, um, could adjust the ventilation settings. So they saw what the humidity was out of spec, turn up the fans, and, um, but the humidity went right down after the chores were done, right? So then now the pigs, now the ventilation is too high for those pigs. And so that was also causing um, ill health and more mortality, et cetera. So now if I would just want to go back here for a second, because I want, now it's not going to be very, the, it's not going to be very long before this gets automated, right? So today they're doing all of this by hand. They're looking at all of these videos manually, right? It's not going to be very long before somebody or some company, um, and we are not working on this, but somebody will, uh, automates this by using machine learning uh, because it's pretty straightforward. You get, if you get two million pictures of pigs in nurseries and just say, you know, huddling, no huddling, comfortable, no comfort, and build an algorithm around that, you can automate that and put it into software. And then that can read these videos. So it won't be very long before that becomes automated. But they're, they're more than happy to do it this way at, at Pillen. And, and I talked to Andy about two weeks ago. He said they've got 500 cameras now in their system. Uh, not all, obviously, in nurseries. These are the cameras and the uh, NVR systems that they use. I asked them to give me the actual specs of what they buy. Uh, $600 to $800 per camera installed cost. You see what they've, what they've found on their ROI was that big improvement in nursery mortality, better daily gain. Um, but he, he makes the point that it's, it's fantastic for training as well, right? And for sort of feedback for, the, um, for everybody working in, in the uh, barns. They, their power, you can power wash them. Uh, the only thing that, that I know, Andy didn't say this, but from my experience, you have to be really careful about what you wipe it with because if you create static electricity on the lens, it just sucks the dust right back up, up onto the lens. So um, in a lot of ways, I mean, if you can just let it dry, but sometimes you get the, the, um, um, you know, the, dry, the water droplets on there. But these cam today, these cameras are pretty indestructible on um, uh, being able to wash them down. Uh, and as he said, uh, you can see they focus on the first 10 days after arrival. Uh, and as I say, somebody is going to figure out how to automate that, that video. And then these things are going to rock and roll within production, within production systems. Um, so smart cameras for weight estimation, to go back to what um, that data that David Rosero was showing in terms of value. These, um, these are the companies that I know about that have emerged in the last two years. Um, I, I have personal experience with a couple of these. Um, David Rosero's got the pers personal experience with asymmetrics. Um, DOL is the Danish uh, sensor company. Uh, they brought, I don't know anything about it except that I've seen them, I've seen their announcement and what they're selling. Um, and Pig Brother, uh, sort of interesting name, is out of Hungary. And I think that one is a little bit, um, it's not quite as advanced as these other ones. But, Essentially, these, these, all these camera companies, and like I said, I'll guarantee you in three years, if I was doing this presentation again, there's going to be five more, at least five more of these, these companies emerge. Because now, now, it's, uh, now the technical stuff has been figured out, how to do it. You have to generate, if you generate three million pictures of pigs um, like this, right? You put a camera up above a feeder, you generate three million pictures of pigs, and then human annotation says, uh, and you have to weigh these pigs manually, right? That's the hard part of the development of the algorithm. Uh, but then humans say, oh, this pig right here, this pig weighed you know, 200 pounds. This pig weighed 190 pounds. This pig weighed 
170 pounds. And, he, and um, so you hire a bunch of people to do those annotations. But how long does it take to generate 3 million pictures of pigs in a finishing barn? Well, probably it's about three weeks, right? You got cameras running 24 seven to generate that number of pictures. Of course, it has to be by genetic line. And there's probably a few other factors that you have to figure out. But uh, the generating of the images is not the hard part anymore. And now people know how to do that, how to build algorithms. All the statistical processing engines are available to, to run those. And you, um, you can build them, right? So that's why I said I think there'll be you know, five more of these companies that emerge. Um, this is just an example of smart agritech from Sweden and, and sort of what you can see. I'll go into it in a little bit more detail. Let me just check my uh, time. How much time do I have? Five minutes. So this is what's called um, unidentified individual pig weights. So each one of these dots, um, each one of these dots here, uh, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. The green line is a smooth growth curve. The dots are the individual pigs that have been weighed by the camera each day, right? So you got the fast growing, you got the slow growing. That's a complete distribution of the weight of every pig in that pen by day. And uh, they're not, it's not like we know this is pig 1320 and this is pig, you know, 1210, but it doesn't matter to start with, right? You can use this unidentified individual pig information, just like what David Rosero was showing on the growth curve they get from asymmetrics. And you can um, watch this growth curve happening. You can take the dots away if you want, the individual pig distributions, but just think about, think about that. That's uh, uh, 20 kilograms at the bottom to start with and 40 kilograms at the top. 20 kilogram dis, um, difference in the individual pig weights at the at the start, and that holds true all the way, you know, all the way through. So there's a couple interesting things about this. One is, how likely is it, um, do you think, uh, here we go, how likely is it, do you think, that a pig here moves to up here? I can tell you, my intuition is 0% probability that a pig that's down here moves up here, and one that's here moves down here, unless they get sick, right? So in other words, I think the ones that are down here are gonna stay down here, and oops, uh, and the ones that are up top are gonna stay up top, right? So um, I'm gonna come back to that point in just a, in just a minute. Uh, this is the Farm C, Farm C's out of Israel. Uh, that's, the, the, that's one of their reports. But the same kind of thing, you're getting the same types of reports from each one of these companies, right? Um, the, um, so one thing, I, I'll put on a Merck hat for a minute. Merck in, has invested in Leo. Not, uh, we don't own Leo, but um, Leo is the individual pig um, uh, registration at birth. I mean, you basically tag the pig at birth, get the birth weight, get lactation daily gain, get the wean weight using RFID tags. Um, traceability solution, especially in, in Europe, but you can, um, you know, essentially you can follow these pigs all the way through. So um, we, Merck, uh, this was announced actually the day I started at Merck Animal Health Ventures, um, this uh, investment in, um, in Leo, which has really been run in the U.S. by United Animal Health and Prairie Systems. Joel Stave really has spearheaded the growth of Leo. Leo's used in um, oh, uh, it's hundreds of sites right now, uh, or I think there's nearly 100 customers in the U.S. for Leo and um, and growing and even more uh, in Europe. So individual. So just think about this now. When you start to put some of this stuff together, right? Individual pig birth weight. Well, uh, if you go back to this, uh, here's the way I'm thinking about this. Each one of these pigs, um, and by the way, eventually the cameras will also be able to identify the pigs and they'll tell you exactly which pig and probably technology to mark those pigs based on a, on a weight, right? But each one of these pigs is a cost of production. So you think about that. It's these, this is a bundle of cost of production, 
right? So this, this um, we think of wean pigs, we think of a thousand wean pigs as, um, as a batch of wean pigs and they're all the same. The cost, to the, the wean pig cost coming out of a sow farm for each of those pigs is the same. But the, what, the attributes that they carry and their, that cause them to generate an individual cost of production for a pig is different, right? And a lot of that is going to be based on their birth weight, right? So I've been thinking about this and thinking, well, now which is the lowest cost of production pig in here? Is it, I thought originally my intuition was, well, these are the lowest cost, cost of production pigs, right? The fastest growing ones. Um, but, you know, maybe we would discover that that's not the case. Maybe it's the slower growing ones, which I can't believe, but I, I just want to give equal time to the, you know, to say we don't know yet which is which. But if you can predict this off of birth weight, which is where, you know, Leo comes in, um, maybe, maybe we'll see a redesign of production systems. In other words, maybe what we'll do is we'll have um, fast barns, barns that turn over more quickly and slow barns, right? And I don't know, I'm just saying, I'm just talking about that, just a thought experiment, right? That, that with a, if you put, if you just take, if you predict and you are pretty good at predicting which pigs these are um, and you move them into a fast barn and they stay relatively uniform, then you're talking about a very narrow distribution when you sell those pigs, right? Um, the same thing is true for the lower ones, maybe you decide you're gonna sell the, these, these pigs that are predicted not to grow as fast as these other ones. I mean, th no one has um, stopped to really consider this, um, this as a new way of thinking about pigs. And I'm not saying identify every pig and, identi and, and create a cost of production for every pig. In fact, my conversations with David Rosero would say, he'd say 20% is all you need. I know some other people in Europe that say 10% is, is all you need, right? You don't need to identify every pig. You need a representation of that, of that barn. Uh, so I, I'll, I'm going to stop there. And um, of course, I've got more slides, and I could go on and on. But um, uh, I do think that um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, the, the analogy that I've come up with um, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and thinking about this is, uh, remember, well, you know what fracking is, right? So, uh, for oil and gas, right? So I think a lot of this technology is going to be like fracking, where all of a sudden it's a new way, a new invention of releasing trapped value, right? So in oil and gas, it was a new way to get, to free up oil uh, from, um, you know, from, trapped in rocks and all the rest of that. And whether you're pro or, I don't care if you're pro or con fracking, I just am thinking of it as an analogy here. If you look at what David Rosero's work, when he was showing the value, you know, $1.82 a pig, $4.80 a pig, $4 a pig on coefficient of variation, et cetera, et cetera, you can begin to see that there are ways to release trapped value in your production systems, right? That, and that's gonna take something like this new technology um, and not just one of them, right? It's gonna have to be a combo of these technologies that, um, that, are, th that we discover over the next three to five years are sort of finding these opportunities within a production system. And, I'm, and I think it's gonna be 15, 20% drop in cost of production based on these, um, these new technologies. So I'll leave it there and, and uh, say thanks.